Do I sound like silly I know as what I I'm feel? Doing? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to start right up. Sure. Tell us your name. Thomas Evan Hill the third. And Thomas, you had to start uh, as a chemist at Pratt and Lambert. Actually, I started as a chemist with Mary Carter Paints in Tampa, Florida. And then I worked for Harris Paints in Tampa, Florida. And then in 1975, I was recruited to go to work for the Pratt and Lambert Corporation in Buffalo, New York from Tampa, Florida. When I took the employment physical, the physician, there was a section for intelligence, and he wrote questionable <laughs> because I moved from Tampa to Buffalo. <laughs> so I started, I started at Pratt and Lambert in 1975, yes. How many years at Pratt and Lambert? Uh, let's see, Pratt and Lambert was sold in 1996, so it would have been 21 years at P and L. And I and I started as a research chemist and had a number of different positions. Actually I never had the same job for two years straight. And when the company was sold I was the I was a group vice president for research. Um, and, and I had responsibility for all the trade sales businesses. Can you tell me your relationship to sell you telling the light? Um I actually was a chemist responsible for formulating them. Hmm. Now, they had been introduced well before I went to work for Pratt & Lambert, but in my first job with Pratt & Lambert, I was responsible for uh, oil-based coatings, 38 clear finish, far more cellutone, vitrolite, permalize, effect of those finishes. You know, we did a historic home here in Seattle last year. It's called, it's called the Norvell home. It's a, a Swiss chalet. And when it came down to test products, um, we actually use cellutone. Yeah. Because it's it's really the last of the animals that gives us the sheen that we want in the performance. Yeah. The it it's it's funny. I was always uh, I always felt that cellutone's name was pretty humorous because its name is cellutone satin. A semi-gloss enamel. <laughs> that was, that's the official name. It's cellutone satin. So the names didn't really mean anything in terms of the sheens or anything like that. But yeah, the when when uh, Pratt and Lambert made manufacture our own alkyd resins, so that was one of the reasons we were able to uh, design products that that fit what we wanted them to do. A lot of other people, you buy commercial alkyds and then you try to try to get them to work. We manufactured our own so we could tweak them to do anything we wanted to do. So after a long run at Pratt & Lambert, working in the different coatings and obviously seeing what a VP and a chemist has to deal with, what the market will bear, what, client, what buyers are interested in buying and then developing those products, um, obviously, that led you all. That, that led you down the road of starting, you know, C two today. C two. So, so can you talk briefly about the um, way the inspiration and, and and you know about C two because that's what people are interested in. Well, I was um, in 1996. You know, I was there was a, a management group of 14 that ran the Pratt and Lambert Corporation. We were a 550 million dollar company. And I was one of that management group. And when Sherwin Williams bought the company, they got rid of all but four of those people immediately. Like the day they took over, 10 of those people were gone immediately. And they kept me and said they wanted me to continue to work for them. I worked for Sherwin Williams for about nine months with a sign on my forehead that said redundant resource and a target on my chest. So nine months later, they called and said, we really don't need you anymore. You know, thank you. Here's your severance. So I needed to do something. Um, I had noticed through the years that uh, the brewing industry consolidated fairly rapidly, and that spawned a bunch of microbreweries. 
and the most successful of those microbreweries was Sam Adams. And I felt that there was room in the trade sales portion of the business for a specialty company like a microbrewery. And since I knew, I knew what sold, you know, I knew where the costs were, I knew, you know, what, you know, everything, everything about the intricacies of manufacturing, um, I felt that we had an opportunity to create this kind of a niche business. So we got, uh, oh, eight to ten dealers together in Chicago, uh, talked about it and said, okay, let's put a business plan together. Uh, three, four months later, we got together in Calgary, Alberta and said, look, if we're going to do this, each of us is going to throw in 50 grand and we're going to get moving on this company. And we decided to do that, so the company started in January of 1999. So, and we've just grown from there. So we didn't start selling any paint until probably the end of 1999. And the first paints we sold were a contractor line. Color system came out in about, what, 2000, 2001. And, you know, we've been successful since then. So when you were doing your original business plan, did you create a SWOT? I think that's uh, strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities. Yes, we did. And uh, this is the first I've heard of the Sam Adams model, um, but it totally makes sense. Where did you think when you had your original nine dealers and getting them to buy in in this launch, what did you see that as the first five years as C2, who would be your clients and how would you guys be different? We felt, we felt that the clientele would be um, designer focused dealers, independent dealers, and only independent dealers, uh, who were who were interested in selling a, a really high end product, and we felt that those we didn't think there's a lot of lot of room in the uh, in the channel for that that kind of a business model. And the reason I say that is you look at the, if you, if you think of, um, you think of a bell curve, okay? And here on the left side of the bell curve is low price. Right side of the bell curve is high price. There's not a lot of area under the curve, under the tails on either side. So we knew there was not a tremendous amount of uh, space available under there. But we felt there was probably a hundred million dollars worth of space available for us. There was probably five hundred million dollars total, and maybe a hundred million for us is what we thought. So that's where we—that's who we were targeting. That's who we were looking for, and those are the kind of those are the kind of businesses that we we attracted. Uh, in the first, we were growing very very nicely. Until we ran into, until Benjamin Moore discovered we were alive, and you know, all of a sudden they decided that uh, uh, they didn't want to. They they sent a letter out to deal all of their distribution channel that said, if you take on the Coatings Alliance, we're going to pull the brand from you. And that kind of was a that uh, uh, kind of put some water on our campfire. So. so this is a beat up copy, but it's my favorite. And I know pretty soon it's gonna be outdated because there are brand new colors that are going out, which we'll talk right. about in a second. Right. But I'd like you to dive right into um, what makes C2 unique, which is, which is clearly these colors. Uh, from a, from a brief background here, just here in Seattle, uh, we, we know that uh, Daly's is the exclusive dealer of C2 paint in Seattle. And um, I'm kind of an old school painter, it takes me a while to change. So we were embedded with <laughs> using the, uh, you know, color key, Ameritone, sure. and the Benjamin Moore. Sure. Because those two decks were in every architects and designers yeah. drawer. One of the strongest design build companies in Seattle is, um, JAS Design Build, and probably around 2001, 
um, they began to, their designers began to specify C2 colors. Number one, it's right up the, right up the street from, uh, you know, from Daly's paint. Mm -hmm. um, but as I, sometimes it takes me a while to kind of notice what's going on. But what I, what I initially noticed was that the C2 color deck, which is much smaller in the number of colors, versus like, I won't name any names, but some of the color systems that have 800 colors, what people don't realize is that out of those 800 colors, it's really only 20% of the colors that are used all the time. The C2 color system, which I'll let you take the floor and talk about, all of these colors are individually selected by color people. And there's, there's not that discrepancy where only 20% of them are used. Obviously, some of the whites, cotton, yeah. wedding cake, stout is a strong color, C2 barnacle is a color that we use a lot. Can you just speak to... Well, let me tell you about the uh, genesis of the color system. Thank you. Um, when we were putting the company together, uh, uh, my background is I am a chemist. I know how to formulate paint. I also manufactured colorant at Pratt & Lambert. Those people reported to me as well. And I recognize that anybody can spend the amount of money to make a really good paint. And, and that's kind of what a number of our competitors have done. They've introduced super premium paints that are very, very good paints. But they've spent more money on raw materials. We felt long term the way we could compete is on color. We also recognize that the majority of the color systems that are out there are generally let down color systems. So you have maybe 20% of the colors that are lighter, darker, but they're the same color, just lighter or darker. We decided that we wanted to have 496 colors. And the reason it's 496 is that that's how many fit in the color center. I mean, it's no, you know, it's no deep, dark secret or anything it wasn't like that. Random number 496. No, we, we, we wanted chips to be a certain size, and the color center had to be usable by a five foot two inch woman. So as far as you could reach up and, and reaching down and as wide as you could do to get two people at the center, it worked out to 496 colors. So we developed 496 individual colors. We always, we started from a perspective of what we defined as complexity with color. And what we define complexity to mean more than three colorants plus white. Now I don't know if you call what goes into them pigments or colorants or in the East Coast they call them pigments. I call them colorants. So it's individual colorants plus white. So it's more than four. The reason we did that is because it's more interesting to your eye. All right, it's, uh, you know, as, as the light changes throughout the day, it's more interesting to you. Uh, my son refers to this as a uh, interesting palette. It, it tastes better. The more flavors in the palette, the individual flavors, the better the taste. I kind of refer, to, I talk about it as music. I mean, if you hit middle C time after time after time, it's boring. You add another note, it's more interesting. You add more notes, it's even more interesting. You know, we look at this as a concerto for your eyes. Now we've moved from what I referred, what we refer to as, as. Tom, will you excuse me one second? I'm gonna grab the color right again. Sure, sure. That little section over again. Tom Hill, John Shear. Tom is the founder of C2 Paint. And I want to I wanted drill down directly into why C2 is unique. So as a little bit of background, uh, I'm a painting contractor here in Seattle. I buy paint, I buy C2 Paint uh, directly from uh, the exclusive dealer of C2 Paint in Seattle, Daly's Paint. And it was probably around the early 2000s that I began to see the color being pinged by designers. Uh, a, a firm that we work with a lot JAS Design Build began to specify some of the C2 colors. And um, I had a long run of using Ameritone, the color key system, and of course, the Benjamin Moore 
um, classics, which is in every architect and designer's drawer. Um, but the C2 paint started coming around, and what I first noticed was that there are not nearly as many colors. And I've always known that some of the bigger color systems, I think from a business perspective, these companies like to show lots of colors because it gives clients the idea of options. Although, in my opinion, most of them are confusing. And when you look at a system that has 1,000 colors, only 20% of them are actually used. C2's color deck, lightweight compared to the rest. Also, 16 colorants to get to different color spaces. Yeah. You are the most qualified as the founder of the company to speak to that. Would you please? When we put the company together, we believed that uh, there's two things you can compete on. One's the quality of the product, the other's the color system. We felt that, that if somebody, some competitor wanted to spend the, enough money, they could match the quality of our products. And we've seen that happen over the years where when we introduced our products, we were like this much better than everybody else. And now, well, now we've reintroduced, we've redone some formulas, so we're better, but it's not, it's not this much better. You know, they've, they've improved the product performance. However, in terms of the colorant, the color system, we felt that we could do a better job. And, and because we had no legacy systems, we had no dispensing equipment in the field, we could do what we felt was best. So we did a worldwide technology search for colorants, and we chose colors that come from the CPS company, who were headquartered in Sitard, the Netherlands. Actually, the company's headquartered in uh, Finland, but the colorant portion is in Sitard, in the Netherlands. Uh, it's 16 colors, 16 individual colorants, as you can see. Yeah, those are the older systems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 16 individual colorants and we use these colors to produce 496 individual handcrafted colors. Handcrafted from the meaning that we just didn't take some spectrophotometer and match them. We did these things manually. We looked at them, we tweaked them, did we like them, didn't we like them, did we, you know, and, and that's how we put them together. Now, the colors, our, our philosophy was to be complex. Complex means that we use more than three of these pigments plus white to produce a color. That's what complex means. We now use a full spectrum approach, a complex full spectrum approach, which means we use more than three pigments plus white, but we also do not use black in tinting these things. So it's more of an artist palette. And we, we do this because my, my son would say it, it, uh, it, it's a blend of flavors which is more interesting to your mouth. I talk about it as more of a, uh, in terms of music, if you hit middle C time after time after time, it's kind of boring. You add another note, it's more interesting. A couple of more notes, it's even more interesting. So it's kind of like a concerto for your eyes while it's on the wall. Is it, it, a, is it a fair statement to say that uh, you and your team, the original founders of C2, introduced the term full spectrum, spectrum to the color lexicon? Uh, not really. Not really. That's because that, that full spectrum terminology really started on the East Coast. There is no official definition. Of full there, there is no official definition of full spectrum. There isn't. Uh, but it really did start, it did start on the East Coast with... Uh, Kaufman. Yeah, Donald Kaufman. Donald Kaufman colors. That's really where it started. And, and everybody was doing something a little bit different. All right. Uh, now one of the reasons, one of the other reasons we did this is we recognize that, you know, we can get a color spec and someone, someone can take it down the road to uh, a competitor and try to knock off the color. But if, if you have a color, you know, one of these colors like this, that let's say there's seven different colorants that make up this color, it's virtually impossible to knock off. 
If you don't have a real good color sense and you don't care about color, yeah, you can knock it off. But if you care, it's almost impossible to knock off. The other thing we did when we put this color system together is fan decks and color cards and all of those things historically have been made out of lacquers. So there's all these disclaimer on these things that this is a representation of the color. The actual color is what you get in the can, da 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 Well, we made our color tools out of our paint. So this is our paint. So and now it's our eggshell enamel. So it's what you see is what you get. Uh, we also recognize that now these these chips on the fan deck are larger than the normal chips on a fan deck. But even if these being as large as they are, we recognize that it's been very difficult for people to make color selections. So we introduced something that we refer to as an ultimate paint chip, which is 18 by 24 inches. And that's something you can tape onto your wall and you can move to different walls and in determine whether you like the color or not. And we were unique in doing that. That's, uh, nobody had anything like that. So. An anecdote. Yeah. You know what a B-roll is? In a video, a B-roll is when I superimpose an image. So when okay. you say that, you know, the super drawdown, I'm yeah. gonna show a picture of it. I, I was gonna say, I didn't know if you had one or not. It'd be, it'd be. Uh, yeah, I have a really beat up one in the car that's not. I'm gonna put them, uh, I'm gonna introduce the image. Sure. Right in the video. Sure. Now, do you do you want me to do you want us to talk about? You haven't even seen this. I I do. I'm actually going to ask you. A, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. We're actually filming. I'm I'm going to ask you a question. This will be the new ones. And and then we're going to right after that we'll cut it and then we'll do one okay. for the new one. And right. I'll ask you specifically. So. All right. I, I want you to address why no black. I think that's really okay. Familiar. And I think he'll be able to answer it in my okay. in my color. So, Tom, I'd like you to. I think you're best to articulate. I I use my own my own explanation. Um, for how to get to certain color spaces. So I'll use a real life story. One of my, um, a project that we did last year for a Seattle high rise <clears throat> on the 23rd floor, lots of natural light. Mm -hmm. I got a call from, um, she's a customer now, a, pr a previous customer, but uh, her name is Professor Nancy Grote. And uh, she really likes yellow. Yellow was in her previous house and she wanted it on the wall. She wanted warmth. And they had gone through a process of testing lots of colors. So she actually did a web search and found us. Um, when you do a search in Seattle for Ferro and Ball, you find my company. Sure. And so she wanted some advice for colors. Um, so I came out to help her. And uh, once I saw some of her samples, and she had lots of yellows up, about seven of them. And most of them were really too acidic. And um, I pointed her directly to a color within five minutes, which is C2 Moxie. I'm mm -hmm. sure you're familiar with that color. Mm -hmm. And she asked me, well, how come can this be matched? And I said, probably not. But the best explanation I could give her is that there are more colorants in C2. They don't try to cut it with black. And there's also a high and a low yellow. So we're able to get you know, all of our cabinets, all of our walls painted in that. But if that question were posed to you, how come these colors can't be matched besides that we have unique colors, can you drill down and maybe give a better explanation so that owners and designers might be able to better understand that? The, the, every color has a mathematical signature. And when you blend these mathematical signatures, you end up with a final color. All right? Now, you can't match that final mathematical signature unless you have the signatures that go into it. The, the, the way spectrophotometers work is they are generally a bridge spectrophotometer. So between, between um, the visual spectrum, they take, an, they take 32 measurements, and then they curve fit between those measurements. Okay, that's, that's the way they do it. Well, you can have a point that's between the measurement that maybe it's up here instead of on that line. 
And that's why if you don't have the actual mathematical equations of, of each of these colorants, you can't, you can't get something that matches. So now, essentially you're saying there's a, because you, from the ground up, you're building these unique colorants and there's a mathematical map. Yep. And these are certain points on the map. Yep. With your colorants and you're trying to match them with a different colorant system. It just misses. Yeah. And, and you'd said earlier that there are some people that close is okay. I, I find that a lot of my clients close is not okay. Well, well, again, again, it's you know I I've looked at I've looked at things. Uh, I've seen you know knockoffs of our matches that I don't think are even close, and people have accepted them. You know, so I, I you know, I, I, color is perception. And some people are more astute in terms of perception than others. Uh, just like, uh, you know, some people have a real nose and palate for wines, fine wines. Fine wines would be totally wasted on me, okay? But other people can tell, you know, they can say, oh yeah, that's a da-da-da-da, from da-da-da-da, da. you know, I can't, I can't do any of that. I can do it for color. I can do that. You know, I have that kind of a sophisticated palette for color, but uh, not for wine. And other, you know, people have different sophistications in their palettes. So, Tom, there's some big news. There's a brand new color. There are new colors and a brand new color system. Will you tell us how it's different? We have uh, we have replaced all of these colors with with new colorants and the new colorants are are you know, the primary focus of the new colorants was uh, we wanted to make sure we had low VOC per color products all right but at the same time we wanted to improve the performance of the colorants so we now have uh, uh, we're using a green oxide for instance that gives us a nice uh, muted space, but it's an oxide, so it's going to be really, really good for exterior durability. It's color fast. All these colors fast. All of them are. Yeah, we are, used. Right, the hide is incredibly impressive. Hides like, incredibly. You don't even know that colorant yeah. can affect how the paint performs. Yeah. So we, throughout the system, all of, all of the colors yeah, are, are color fast. Yeah, everything's color fast. Um, we have a, you know, again, we have some, like, like. One of the things you have with trade sales colorants is you get you get a uh, like bright reds. We have the best bright red, light fastness colorant you can get, but it's not as light fast as an automotive red because it's about five times less expensive than an automotive red, and it's still very expensive. Okay. I would imagine five times more expensive than than the traditional colorants. Perhaps well, well, you're looking at for two, a three hundred dollars an ounce. Yeah. Or I mean, I mean a quart. Yeah. Or more. Yeah. Well, more than that. Yeah. We have five dollars a have, quart. Well, look, we're we're now we're now looking at we have a uh, a yellow that's a bismuth vanadate yellow, that is a bismuth bismuth vanadate yellow Biva yellow, and it sells for one hundred and thirty five dollars a quart. Okay. But it is the most la light Tom? fast yellow. Can you give a comparison to price wise? Yeah, like so if that's 130 for a quart of yellow, what's a traditional what's the traditional organic yellow might go for about uh, forty dollars, forty five dollars a quart. But it's about ten times as light fast. We did an exposure we did an exposure on our test fence in Florida. Uh, we put a yellow out, and, and there's a measure of, uh, of color difference. It's called delta E, all right? And the traditional yellow, uh, after about nine months on the fence, the delta E was 28. So the change in the color from the original to where it was then was 28, which means the yellow had pretty much disappeared. The new bismuth vanadate yellow, the change was 1.2. And this is in, this is South Florida at 45 degrees exterior. So a severe, severe fade resistance test. We also have in here a product called cobalt blue. 
if you're an artist, you know cobalt blue. Uh, and, and these things are much stronger. Uh, every one of, we've reformulated all of the colors in this palette. Every one of these colors will cover in a maximum of two coats. Most of them would cover in one coat. A good painter like yourself, I'm sure, could get it covered, get it done in one coat. But so what you're telling me is if I decide to paint a wall and curtain call, and it's a white wall right now, brand new GWB, uh, and a coat of primer, and we're brought into paint. Um, two coats max. That, or how about blue beard? Is a very two deep coats max. So it would be a dream. It would be a dream for, for anybody who's painting. We've reformulated all these things. You're familiar. We had to come out with this accent color system primer because we had some of these colors that just didn't look good. They didn't cover real well. There were there were a few points that needed yeah, three or four they, coats. They, we, yeah, and so we've re, it, we've replaced those. We've reformulated everything in this, and and you know we upgrade our color system every four years or so. We take a look at it every two to three years, but it takes another year to get everything everything done. So we're introducing new colors in the fall. I think it's what? 88. 88 new colors in the fall. So we're going to retire 88 colors and introduce 88 new colors. Uh, you mentioned... Or 66. No, I think it's 88. You mentioned, you mentioned earlier that a lot of color systems, only 20% of the palette works. We, it's purchased. <laughs> we, are able, we are able to gather data from our dispensing equipment so we know exactly how many colors are purchased. And, and this system here, it's uh, 55 to 60 percent of the colors represent 80 percent of what we do. So the old 80-20 rule, 20% 20 of the colors would represent 80% of what you do. With us, it's... Uh, Pareto principle. Yeah. With us, it's 60% of the colors represent 80% of what we do. So uh, the, the color system works hard. And the new system is gorgeous. Okay. At the same time, we've developed a relationship with Barry Dixon. Uh, and Barry Dixon's a, a well-known designer on the East Coast. Uh, I think he's done some work, a decent amount of work through Farrell and Ball. Um, he put them on the map. And we That's are, my opinion. We are, we're pleased to really introduce what we refer to as the Naturals Collection of Colors by Barry Dixon. He put these, all of these colors together. I heard from that. From his farm. Yeah. From his farm in Virginia. That that was the uh, that was the inspiration for all the colors. And this this is hot off the press. Okay. Ow. It's the only one that. That's interesting. We're, we're rolling. Oh yeah. That's interesting. John, I like how your shirt goes with the dry. <laughs> well, as I was saying, we. You, you make drawdowns. In the laboratories, we make drawdowns over a, a chart that the half, the top half is black, the bottom half is white. And then we do a measurement over the black half and a measurement over the white half, divide them into each other, and get what's called a contrast ratio. Now, if the color over the, the white half and the color over the black half were identical, the contrast ratio would be 1.00. All right, all of these colors in here have contrast ratios that are, let's say, 0.994 or better. All right, the, uh, the accepted definition of hiding in the paint industry is 0.98 or better. These are all 0.994 or better in terms of how they hide, how they cover. So you're going to get you're going to get one or two coat coverage at the maximum. So I say two coats because no matter how good a painter you are, there are always holidays. Always. Yeah. Tell me the story of how you approached Barry Dixon. Heavy, heavy weight in the design industry, definitely an original. We, we, um, 
We developed a relationship with uh, someone in the Washington, D.C. area uh, whose name is Colleen Scully. And she did some work for one of our partners in the Washington, D.C. area, Houseworks. And Colleen knew Barry Dixon. And Colleen was very, very excited about the color palette. And she felt that Barry would be equally excited about the color palette. So she presented the color palette to him, and he was very excited about it. Wanted to meet us, wanted to see if we could set up a relationship together, and we have. And we have. And we're very delighted with the uh, uh, relationship. It's, it's, you know, he's been speaking on our behalf somewhat now. Uh, he was at our annual meeting in Cancun in February, but we now have his, this, this, color, this color card is now, just now being introduced. Just now it's being introduced. And when will the worldwide launch be? Uh, it's going to be through Barry, so we have, to ship, we have to ship a number of cards to him, like 500, and then set up when he's going to introduce it. I believe that we should be we should have a notice out to Robin and our other other partners by the end of the week that they can they can order these things. We have four thousand of them in our office in Buffalo right now, so we're just working through how we uh, the logistics of how we ship them and all that. Let's play guess the C two paint color. Uh, not me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Robin would be the one. We, we have stacks and stacks of these for all of our clients. Robin would be the these, guest to paint. These color. were stacks, but these are all C2 eggshell drawdowns for clients. Yeah, I'm guess. not the I'm not the guest the paint color guy. I believe it or not, I'm a I'm a paint chemist. I'm a purist as a paint chemist. And when you put colorant in my paint, you contaminate it. I don't care how I don't care how much or how little colorant you put in my paint; it's a contaminant. So my objective in this, now I recognize that I'm probably the only one who wants to use white paint everywhere. All right. However, the more colorant you put in, the more contamination there is. So my objective in designing colorants and color systems is to use as little little colorant as possible in the paint. So that the properties of the paint are not um, are not marginalized in any way. All right, and I, and I, I kind of laugh about it being a contaminant because you know you have the you have the artistic side of the company and then you have the the technical side of the company and there's always a there's always a natural tension between the two of us. All right, so uh, yeah, so I I know. I'm probably more, you could probably more show me a paint film and I could probably tell you, you know, what the paint is and what day it was made and all that stuff. But if you tell me a color and you say, you know, what color is that? I don't know. I'm going to say, it's a nice color, you know, but that's about, that's about all I'm going to be able to tell you. Would know what color these things are. Tom, <clears throat> Robin had asked a question earlier. I'm going to have you address it. Let's see here. Let's talk about black. Yes. The absence of black. Yes. What, what is black? Is black a color? Where does it fit in the whole paint world? Well, in black is a dechromatizer. Okay. It it remove it 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 moves more towards the gray scale. There's black. Yeah. There's black. Black There's takes black. you black takes you to the gray scale. Black's it's it's beautiful. I mean, if you like, if you like. Uh, no, hold on a second. What does it mean take you to the grayscale? For someone. Well, who all right. The the colors are three dimensional. All right, and there's a lightness darkness scale, which is the grayscale. One hundred is pure white. Zero is the absence of white or black. Okay, that's zero, and then you've got. An L scale, an L A, L A B. L is lightness, darkness. A is A is red and green. B is yellow and blue. 
on either side of those things are yellow and blue. And depending on where a color is in, in, in color space, it has this LAB signature, all right? Now, what black does is it takes the color from, let's say it's real, it's real light and bright to muted and grayer. So it moves it down on the gray scale. That's what black does, and it's referred to as a dechromatizer. Now, artists generally don't use black because they prefer to dechromatize by blending colors to get down to get down in, in color space. That's why artists use all the complements, split complements, you know, and, and they try to get they try to do that to get down in color space. They use a lot, there's a lot of umbers. So you'll find in our new color system there's a lot of umber that's used as as a dechromatizer as opposed to black. Uh, black kind of mutes the color. It really it really has an effect on the color. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and we've tried to design the system from an artist's palette perspective. <clears throat> Can you speak about the the team at C two, the dealers? What do they what do they <clears throat> what do they bring? <clears throat> How do, what happens when you guys meet when you pick the colors? Well, let me let, <clears throat> let me explain what C two is like right now. <clears throat> C2 is a virtual company, and when I, I mean a virtual company, I, I do mean a virtual company. We have uh, uh, marketing resources that are headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, and we have them on retainer. They're not full-time employees. We have Research and Development in Clearwater, Florida. It's on retainer. We have uh, uh, manufacturing in Andover, Massachusetts that takes this capacity from a a paint manufacturing company. We have uh, PRs in uh, uh, New York City, uh, legals in Buffalo, New York, uh, accountings in Buffalo, New York, and we coordinate everything in Buffalo, New York. Now, the way we're able to do this is each of our partners in this business serves on a different committee if, if they choose to. For instance, Robin Daly is the chair of our marketing committee, and they handle everything we do marketing-wise. Philip Reno of GNR Paint in San Francisco is chair of the color committee. So when we're selecting new colors and doing all the color work, his committee is focused around doing that. We have a product committee. Uh, Sean Clark at Waters and Brown in, uh, uh, outside of Boston is chair of that. So, so we look at new products, we look at how the products are performing, how the products are selling, what do we need to do, what don't we need to do. Uh, we have a finance committee, uh, we have an executive committee, and uh, that's how we run the company. So we essentially have a focus group every day because these people are dealing with the end users all the time. So it's not like a big company where you, you know, it's the independent dealer talks to the, their salesperson, who talks to their district manager, who talks to the area manager, who talks to the VP of this, who talks to, you know, you get right to the top right away. The other thing is generally if, if you have problems with anything, people call me. You know, everybody has my cell number. Everybody, you know, they, they call me and we we get we get things taken care of very quickly. We don't there's not a lot of there's there's not a lot of bureaucracy in our decision making process. So we're relatively nimble. Tom, talk to me about C two uh, cabinet and trimping. Um, definitely <coughs> unique. Uh, I know there's a a regional association with the university, you, you know, the research that went into the how to use that byproduct. It's I, I've used it. It's definitely unique. It is unique. Yeah, it is. It is, it is unique. <clears throat> we <clears throat> stumbled across this. I mean, this is one of these uh, 
serendipitous things that occurs if you're if you're open to other opportunities. Um, the company in Vermont, Vermont Natural Coatings, uh, did some work with the University of Vermont, and and what they were trying to do was find a uh, a utilization for whey, which is a waste product in cheese manufacture. So there's an organic dairy that produces all this organic milk that's used in producing organic cheese, but then there's a waste product that's called whey. Well, the University of Vermont came up with a, uh, a way to produce, yeah, a means to produce a whey polymer. And, and <clears throat> this whey polymer was used in a clear finish for floors and wood furniture and, and, and things of that nature. Well, <clears throat> a couple of our, our partners started to blend this clear in a uh, specific ratio with our satin, satin finish and came up with a, a really unique feeling, smooth, great flow and leveling, uh, positive curing, uh, finish that that really works great for cabinets and trim and and we did we did a significant amount of work with them to try to get this thing working because there there are always little things going on uh, for for instance they were blending this 25% to 75% paint or 50% to 50% paint well when you do that you reduce the hiding of the finished product so it would be a lot better if we could get this blended in the manufacturing stage and not reduce the hiding. So we did a lot of work to do that. We found that there were some incompatibilities between a number of things. It, it, you know, there's just all the things that happened in R&D. Well, we ended up with this uh, cabinet and trim finish that really does a nice job. It, it's a unique product. Right now it's in a satin finish. We're working on a semi-gloss finish currently. Um, I don't think we're gonna have a gloss finish with it because unfortunately the, uh, the product, when it's blended with our paint, lowers the gloss a little bit. So, so there's, a, there's a natural limit to how high you can go in gloss. Products that are similar, you know, have a have another unique story to this. So it's a you know you're you're getting rid of a waste product, and it's and it's a uh, sustainable product. I mean, you know, we're still going to always be drinking milk, and everybody's going to be eating cheese, so they got to get rid of the way. That's a that's a phenomena that's called blocking. All right, and if you put colors together face to face. You know, sometimes they'll block depending on how new they are. I mean, we have, uh, you know, the the old way of removing, getting rid of blocking is you put some talc, talcum powder on it, or you rub it with wax paper, and then it doesn't block anymore. All right, but it would be with latex paints, it would be much more desirable if they didn't block initially. The problem is that, that traditional resins, well, even non-traditional resins, generally you're gonna provide some blocking unless you, unless you run them through an oven. Um, and and the, the whey polymer, uh, the whey product in, in our paint uh, eliminates the blocking problem. A question that you probably didn't expect. Most people think of C2 colors low VOC, water base. <clears throat> we discovered last year working on an older home um, that your oil-based primer is pretty good. Now I know, I can probably put two and two together. You worked on cellutone, you have a long history of working on those paints. That, I don't want to call it a control primer because that's not what you've labeled it, but the C2 exterior primer is, it's been our favorite for when there's a problem we want to treat brand new wood. Speak to how that's different. Yeah. It is different, I know that. The, the oil-based primer is what's referred to as a very long oil alkyd. 
All right, and what that means is that um, the percentage of the percentage of uh, oil uh, to um, to the to the product that converts it to an alkyd, it's it's a higher ratio of alka of oil to the alkyd. Okay? And that gives you better penetration into the wood. It gives you better sealing. Now, the downside of the longer oil length alkyds is sometimes they take a little longer to dry. So that's the downside to them. But they penetrate better and they have terrific adhesion. So that's that's what they're good at. Now the other downside to these things is as uh, VOC regs get tighter and tighter and tighter, uh, they may disappear. Were you the driving force behind that? What the oil the oil base the way it is? Uh, Making I, it, it's weight. It's definitely different. I noticed that. Yeah. For sure. Well, we made sure. What we did is made sure that the product did that. Okay, I made sure it did that. We don't look. Our, our research laboratory, our research laboratory in Florida doesn't do any alkyd research. Okay? I'm probably the only one left in the company that knows anything about making alkyds. So I know what to look for. All right? So, yeah, I point us in the, in the right directions. But there aren't that many people in the country anymore that are making good alkyds. And, and it's going to, again, as the regs get tighter and tighter, they will, sooner or later, unfortunately, they're going to disappear. Although, because this is a specialty product, okay, and, and we, uh, well, you may want to edit this, but uh, we, put on the, we put on the label that it's a stain blocker. So putting it on putting it on a label as a stain blocker gets us into a different VOC category. category so we can keep the VOCs up. Yeah. So John, John has a same high heart VOCs. Well well I, I don't you don't even want to get me into you don't even want to get me into that uh, discussion at all. I mean that's that's a uh, I'm an oil based guy by the way. Well look you know, there there is no definitive science that proves that VOCs cause uh, ozone. Dan, can you grab one of our T-shirts? Yeah. And, and bring it out. There is there is no definitive right science that. No, I just want to. It goes. We'd like to show the founder the part. See the the the, the problem. You know, I'm I'm an, actually I'm an organic chemist by training. All right. The number of equations that it takes for a VOC to get to a uh, something that's going to cause a problem, it's like it's like 20 different steps it has to go through. So, I'd like for you to take this home with you. Okay. This is our sheer shirt. <clears throat> the front of it says "We Heart Alkyd." Well, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming out. You're welcome. Thank You're you for welcome. The, thank you for the spilling the beans on the yeah, oil base. It's, uh, oil based stuff is it's great stuff. But... Now, let me tell you what I think the downside to oil oil based stuff is. Okay. You know it it flows in levels great. It gets as hard as can be. You know, and it gets harder and harder as it cures and, and it no washes well. It. And yeah, all right. Now it cracks. It'll it'll you know if if there's uh, dimensionally unstable substrate it'll crack. My real hang up with oil based products is they yellow over time. That's my big hang up with oil based products and and acrylic products don't yellow. So now if you again when I was at Pratt & Lambert we manufactured our own resins and we made like vitrolite out of uh, coconut oil coconut oil doesn't yellow and we made 38 clear out of safflower oil safflower oil doesn't yellow is that why vitrolite smelled differently 10 years 15 years ago yeah hmm. yeah it had a sweet smell to it yeah 
and we made it out of those oils because they were non-yellowing oils. You know, like like you know the uh, the finishes that you put on uh, um, refrigerators and washing machines. They're all made from those types of oils, so that they're non-yellowing. Uh, soya, linseed oil, those are yellowing oh, yeah. oils. Those are yellowing oils. So that's my only hang-up with Alcan finishes. So. Thank you. Why is it called C2? We started wanting to call the brand Collections of Colors. Unfortunately, Collections of Colors was already trademarked by someone else. We then tried C squared. That was trademarked by someone else. We then found that C2 was not trademarked. Now this is after we'd gone through about 30 potential names. So we wanted something that was kind of short, clever, easy to remember. And, and uh, one of our partners in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, early on was interviewed uh, for an article in the U.S. Air Magazine. And they asked him, why did you call it C2? He said, we wanted something our customers could spell. <laughs> and I, and I said, you didn't say that, did you? Uh, but but he did say that. So uh, he's, if you know him, he's very tongue in cheek. So, uh, but it, it was we started collections of colors. CC we couldn't do that. C squared we couldn't do that. But C two we could mark. So we did. 